Today is Armenian Constitution Day, the flag of our home of one month. People are bumping rap music. And I want to tell you the story of a, the, one of the craziest people I've ever heard about ever in history. Marev Tez. I'm not ethnically Armenian, but the history is amazing. From Hittites to Persians to Romans to Parthians to Mongols, Timurlane, Seljuk Turks to the Ottomans to Azerbaijan, the Armenians are in a fight again today. This is the story of this man. Here's the face of the man in the video in the metro station. One of the craziest stories in all of history actually I've ever heard. Ever. Of anybody. Uh, look at that face. He'll fuck you up. I love this history story, man. I made, I made the video on the Constitution Day. And, they, and you know, he was the one that helped the 1918 Constitution. They had flags all over his square. And this is his train station. This guy is the dopest, craziest story maybe I've ever heard in all of history. At least 20th century history. Uh, you're a bomb, that's right. This guy, dope, dope. An Armenian hero. This square and metro station is named after him. That's not him, by the way. He, that is a uh, Bolshevik guy that the Russian Empire had uh, sent to a gulag and killed. The guy this square is named after is Gergen Nezde, which is an insane story. So this busy square on the outskirts of Yerevan is named after a man, like I said, with one of the most intense stories I've ever heard. An Armenian hero, warrior, world traveler, and dealt with some of the most intense people in history. Lived from 1886 to 1955. Let's walk around the square together. All right. So um, just FYI, any nationalists, Turks, Azeris from Azerbaijan, Russians, Germans, um, Armenians, I'm not Armenian, and especially people from USA too, where I'm from, it's no mean to offend or anything, just have a story to tell here, all right? Um, did a lot of research, figured it out, saw all sides. This is the man, all right. So, maybe we'll walk this way, it's more straight. So he was born in Russian Empire, Armenia, the far south from here, near the Iran border, in an area of the country um, that's now part of Azerbaijan, called um, Nakhet. Sorry for my pronunciations. Nakhekavan. Ah. <laughs> All right, anyway. This, yeah, this square is really interesting. We lived by here. Our apartment was right there where the Kalikia sign is. Um, oh, there's some kids swimming in there. All right. So, sorry for reading, but I got to get this down. So, he went to a Russian elementary, middle, and high school. His father was a priest. Yes, in the ancient Armenian Apollostic Church priests could get married. An 18, at the age of 18 in 1904, he moved to St. Petersburg, Russia. Ooh. Um, which he ended up going to the Imperial University there. But after two years, he dropped out to join the Armenian nationalist movements against the Ottoman Empire and Russian empires. Um, back in his hometown, near Iran. All right, let's walk with the flags here. Walk with the flags. So uh, he soon decided to finish his education though. Oh, whoa, 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 always loud, noise going. And he moved to a place that I know well, to Sofia, Bulgaria. Um, where he, from 1906 to 1908, he went to a military college there. Afterwards, he received a spot as a lieutenant in the Bulgarian army. But a man always on the move. I like that. He returned to his homeland once again in southern Armenia. Now with a full military education to join the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. And then he traveled again. He decided to participate in the Iranian Constitutional Revolution. Down in Iran for some reason. Maybe he had some friends. Maybe he supported one side because they supported Armenians. Who knows? Oh man, the flag. It's not orange, it's tangerine on the bottom. All right, Armenia, my home for nearly four months. A lot of Armenians in California. What's up, everyone? Glendale, uh, Fresno, there's a lot. My good friend, Ryan Belikian, he's Armenian ancestors. 
The Armenian diaspora is a really interesting story, but that's not the story we're telling. We're, storing the, we're telling the story of a man that has a crazy story that's just getting started. So down in Iran, um, they supported a revolution, and in 1909 he went back to Armenia. He was arrested by the Russian imperial authorities and spent three years in prison until 1912 for his revolutionary activities against the Russian Empire. As soon as he went, got out though, he joined, he joined an Armenian battalion that was headed to the Balkans to fight in the Balkan Wars against the Turks. Ooh, awesome. Um, he fought alongside Macedonian and Bulgarian Slavs in campaigns that seized Thrace and Macedonia, freeing them from centuries of Ottoman rule. And we've been to those places too, Bulgaria and um, Macedonia. So it's all coming full circle. It's kind of interesting. In this battle, though, he was shot and wounded, but survived. The one of many times he was actually shot. Uh, really crazy, you know, brave freaking guy. Forever I thought this was his statue, and it's not. It's so weird. They should, they should put his statue. I guess this was Soviet built, and the, the guy we're talking about was an anti-communist, you know, so uh, maybe that's the reason. I don't know, but all right. In Bulgaria, he was awarded the Medal for Bravery, and the Bulgarian forces held res extreme respect for th the ferocity of the Armenian men in the war. The Balkan Wars, which was super intense, and all kinds of countries ended up coming out of there. Albania, Serbia, Bulgaria, um, the whole Greece thing. Ah, that's a whole other story, the Balkan Wars. But Armenians went there. So, you know, a lot of those border lines that were drawn still cause controversy to this day. And uh, I spent nearly two years of my life in the Balkans. I love those crazy motherfuckers there. I'll drink all the Rakia and Raki and all that crazy stuff with them. <laughs> I love it out there too. So, get again had an Armenian battalion out in the Balkans. And he spent a lot of time of his life there, actually, especially Bulgaria. Or, uh, Nezde. Is that how you say it, guys? Gergen Nezde. Gergen Nez. Gergen Nezde. This. That's how you say it. Okay. That guy's cool. Oh, man. Very cool. Okay. So, again, this guy, um,. <clears throat> He again wanted to return to his homeland of southern Armenia and to get guaranteed he wouldn't get arrested again by uh, the Russian authorities, he asked for amnesty, which he got in 1914. So World War I starts and he joins the action again in that insane war, joining the Armenian unit in the Russian Imperial Army that fought, guess who again? The Ottomans, ooh, Turks. <laughs> All right, so he loved fighting Turks. He was appointed commander in 1915 and saw action in 1915 and 16. Where exactly is unclear. I think around the southern border of Russia and Jordan, Georgia now. I'm not sure. Bareftes, Laves. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is a real soft spot and terrible thing for Armenian people Ugh. during World War One. Under the guise of all the countries like France and the US and Germany and Russia and all these powerful countries being bogged down in that war, terrible war, the Turks in some form of revenge carried out the Armenian genocide, which was really terrible. Um, you know, they, the Ottomans, while, you know, Armenians from Anatolia and other places, they were you know, getting rounded up in their villages, marched into the deserts of Iraq and stuff by uneducated Kurds that were working for the Ottomans, um, you know, unarmed civilians, all kinds of terrible stuff. Ah, oh, man. So, obviously, Nejde was pissed about that. While he was fighting brutal battles in the Caucasus fronts in World War I, in the meantime, in 1917, the Bolshevik communists started a revolution in Moscow which this guy was a Bolshevik in the statue here, the Soviets put up. Um, the, the Russian Empire was uh, 
And right before this happened, we're talking about this guy, who was an Armenian Bolshevik communist, and he was uh, arrested by the Russian Empire authorities, thrown into a gulag where he died. So the uh, Russian Revolution happened. All the Russians that were with the Armenian forces and in World War I in general, they fled back to Russia. Um, the, they were out of the war. But not this guy. He led a force of ethnic Armenians to help people flee from the area around cars. Um, to flee that area and go to um, Alexanderpool, modern day Gyumri, my home too, for three months. So he helped people, you know, around Ani, cars, now part of Turkey, I don't know, fucking, but he helped them escape. Uh, but the Turks pursued them, and there were some skirmishes in Alexanderpool, which the Turks ended up briefly seizing. So he took his forces to dig in in Karkalisia, which is modern day Vanzador. So without the help of the Russian forces, um, they were lar largely outnumbered, but he mobilized the locals after a spirited speech in Dilijan, one of the most beautiful, green, amazing places I've ever seen in my life. Um, and he told the people there they needed to wage a sacred battle. So a violent battle happened over four days. Whoa, <laughs> Armenia, uh, he, where he was shot again, but survived. So I think this might be the second or third time. Uh, the, imagine the battles in World War I he saw too, freaking crazy. Um, the Armenians ran out of ammunition, but so did the Turks. And the Turks had to withdraw and they couldn't go deeper into Armenian territory. As a result, why not? Um, locals in the area of Vanzador and Dilijan and up there in Lori, they decided and declared the first Republic of Armenia was established. And guess who was appointed governor? A governor and commander of the southern region, where his home region of Nak. Kitch Kivan was where he returned our buddy here that we're talking about all right so in 1920 he organized another army unit and led them into the Karbak region the contentious area Aktash Ak sorry if I'm butchering these names because there was a uh, massacre of Armenians in a village and he was looking for revenge but um, the Arme so the Armenians ended up taking the area and they marched here to Yerevan. All right, cool. And the Azerbaijan people under pressure, woo, sorry about the wind, under pressure from the winning side of World War I that called the Antonite powers, they were pressured to stop, you know, killing Armenians in villages. But then the Soviet Red Army arrived, ooh. So things were finally organized in Russia after a lot of death and purges and you know after the 1917 revolution and 1920 USSR the United Socialist Soviet Republic was created and uh, you know it wasn't all smooth though white some people called white Russians were fighting for freedom in Siberia with the capital of Omsk and all kinds of crazy allies and Americans and Japanese were going in there but against the Red Army or which this guy supported, the guy standing in his, this guy's square. Maybe it was named after him first in the Soviet times, and they changed it to this other guy's name. That's what I'm thinking. Um, that's probably true. Okay, so they were high, largely outnumbered by the Red Army, who just outnumbered. They had to give up Karbakh to the Soviets. This is the same area of contentious war and fighting to this day. Um, crazy. So again, in his hometown of the South, he would go back and forth to his hometown. Probably had a lot of family there, you know, friends, grandparents and stuff. And now he had a lot of power there. So he, whoa, <laughs> he uh, expelled all any Turkic speaking people from anywhere in those lands. Um, because why not? And uh, in some fighting against them, he again was shot and survived. Jeez, <laughs> for trying to expel some people. So the Soviets, though, they came down and uh, captured all of Armenia by the end of 1920. Sovietization was complete. Any dissent was purged, which were people that didn't want, you know, wanted to free Armenia still. Uh, maybe they weren't, they didn't like communists. So this angered Nezhde, he actively helped Armenians that were anti-communist. 
The Soviets carved up a bunch of lines on the map and gave a ton of territory to Soviet Azerbaijan, which again angered Nezhde, uh, especially for all he invested in Karbakh and the massacres of the Armenians there. These lines still cause problems to this day. Soviet drew those lines, um, just like the British drew the lines in Africa and French in Africa and the Middle East and yeah, you know, the empires of the past didn't really think the lines they were carving here. So it's such a cool day to do this on uh, Constitution Day of Armenia with all the flags here. I was busy all day when it was sunny, but this is kind of all right with the wind. I hope everybody can hear me. Sorry for the reading, but I want to make sure I get all this information correct. Okay. So this, you know, these Soviet lines are the same lines that uh, divide Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we're in, uh, you know, four months of that battle. Oh, look at she grabbed the flag. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> you know, Belarus, Lithuania, all this stuff. All these new republics, but they were part of the same country. Okay, so this guy was a stern anti-communist after this, especially when they gave all the territory to Azerbaijan for some reason. And he remained in the area far south of his home, organizing the local population to resist the Soviets and Soviet Azerbaijanis, despite calls to give up his fight from some of his powerful Armenian friends who had been given um, you know, leniency and good positions in the government and stuff. No, we didn't walk around the circle. Here we go. But he refused to give in to those bitches. <laughs> uh, which was really dangerous at the time. You know, the Soviets were newly very powerful uh, entity that nobody could really check in 1921. So, you know, there was a Soviet sack in 1921 of Yerevan by anti-communist which he was not involved in but they held out for 42 days only and the armenians uh, nationals lost the city to the soviets but after that 20,000 people fled to where he was where his base home base was in the far south including 10,000 soldiers near iran border so he was involved in now the declaration of the self-governing regions known as the Republic of Mountainous Armenia. Ooh, I like that too. Independent and autonomous. At the time, a very dangerous game. He didn't give a fuck. He was a supreme commander and prime minister with some help of some other Armenians. In the, uh, in the summer of 1921, the Red Army conducted a massive attack and after months, a fierce battle, the Republic capitulated after existing for only three months. Oh, man. And he and others fled to Tabriz, Iran, which is the largest big city to our, uh, in Iran to Armenia. I met someone from there the other day, actually. A couple guys. Um, so after four months in Iran, he moved to, again, a place I'm familiar with, Sofia, Bulgaria, and that he was familiar with. He went to college there, university. Um, before the world changing World War I, now we're in the 20s. He married a local Armenian living there and began to become involved in Armenian political and uh, organizational activities in the 1920s and late 20s and 30s, mid 20s and 30s. Uh, because he was, you know, angry about all these events that were happening, the, the Soviets, the Tur Ottomans, the Turks. But now he was a little bit more of a speaking man. Uh, he began doing a lot of speaking to large Armenian diaspora communities, first all over Bulgaria and Romania, like pla in places like Plovdiv and Bucharest, then to the United States, like in Boston, uh, and more, all over the country. In, 1993, in 1993, 1933, he moved to the United States, to Boston, and he toured all over the USA and Canada to places where Armenians lived, mostly who had escaped the genocide, uh, like my friend's grandparents, California probably went to California. He, he created something called the Armenian Youth Foundation in the USA. Look at that, pretty cool. A traveling man. So he was kind of done with war for now, but not really. Um, a little, you know, he was a little older by now and he supported friends in all kinds of causes. Like in 1934, he moved again back to Sofia and helped revolutionary Macedonians 
who wanted their own freedom. What up, Skopje, Macedonia? I've been there too. Um, another place I've been and I like. Three months of my life I lived there. Man, Skopje, good place. Everywhere is a little different, but it's funny how he went to all these places. In 1937, he was fum summoned to Cairo, Egypt by Armenians there. There had been some disagreements between factions of the group he was involved with, and they never were resolved. So again, he headed back to Bulgaria and opened an Armenian newspaper in Plovdiv, 1938. Always a close friend, friend of revolutionaries like the Macedonian Slavs I mentioned, and uh, all the Armenians, of course, that were angry. All right, now the most brutal war in World War II history. He had a very crazy role in this war. Um, because he, well, yeah, let's talk about it. All right, in the late 30s, Nazi Germany had been getting very powerful, mid 1930s, and he decided to support the Nazis because he thought he would, they would help him. Uh. <laughs> um, Bulgaria also was initially in support of the Axis powers, which where, is where he was, so it made sense, you know, and he was anti-communist. Plus, nobody really knew the horror the Nazis would become in the late 40s, mid 40s, so, you know, hide inside is 2020, but the Nazis had a lot of support in the 1930s, more than people realize, um, even people in America, they actually did. All right, so Adolf Hitler had him uh, join, had him be the leader of a German, Bulgarian, Armenian operation. And the plan was to sack the Turkish capital of Ankara, but it never came to fruition. And uh, he was a little angry by this, but 1942, Adolf Hitler invited him to Berlin, Germany. Imagine visiting Berlin, Germany in 1942. Talk about crazy. Um, being invited there, whoa. <laughs> um, he, w he was made the leader instead of leading that battalion of an Armenian council to convince Armenians anywhere in the world to join the Nazi side to avoid going to concentration camps because they were uh, communists, he believed. The, the, a lot of Armenians didn't want to get sent to our concentration camps, so they joined them. The Nazis even created the Armenskish, Armenskish Legion, composed of captured Soviet Armen Armenian POWs from the Soviet Army that switched sides. Um, to avoid the camps. The, batil the battalions, which Nezjay thought were going to get sent into Turkey, to his dismay, were um, sent to the Eastern Front, to Crimea of all places. And an interesting place, uh, you know, a place still of contention on the North Black Sea that was once part of the Roman Empire. Um, Russia, Russia captured it in 2014 and it's a major base of operation for their assault on Ukraine today in 2022, Ugh, Crimea. So, okay, so he wasn't fighting as much anymore, but he headed to the briefly occupied Nazi Crimea in 1944, where he analyzed everything and was like, fuck this, this is a brutal hellscape, and he returned to Sofia as the war started turning south on the Germans. So he, when he left Crimea, he disbanded his Armenian unit. He just saw all the death and horrible destruction. Uh, and knew, you know, they were fighting a losing cause, you know, and all the human suffering, and probably, you know, the Holocaust, and just, ah! He was a man of heart, you know, a violent man, passionate guy, but Doing this kind of shows me that he was like, you know, uh, maybe this is going too far, but okay. So he wanted to get away from Nazis and Hitler. And Hitler, at this time, was a meth and heroin addled madman who lost his shit. He was losing the war. And the USA and the USSR were uh, surrounding them on both sides and pretty much fucking them up. So the insanity of World War II was coming to an end. USA, USA, why not? One of the most important things the United States of America ever did was World War II. Uh, really, we'd be living in a man of the high castle world. Imagine if those two other entities won that war. Who knows what the world would be like? I wouldn't be standing here probably. This city might be, who knows? Okay, anyways, before the end of the war, in 1944, 
a man who had met Hitler before, he decided to write a letter to Joseph Stalin, <laughs> trying to convince him um, that he would support the Soviets now if they helped him attack Turkey, which was always his dream. He wanted to sack the entire lands. Um, the World War II ended, the Soviets massacred and raped their way into Berlin, which I've also been, you know, Russia, Russia. <laughs> uh, and our friend in, was in Bulgaria again, waiting for a reply from Stalin. Stalin messaged him and said he must travel to Moscow to discuss, discuss the offer with Stalin. He was seriously considered. He said to himself, likely something like, you know, fuck these Turks, I've been fighting them all my life. Their country is on the Soviet border. They were once Christian lands of the Eastern Roman Byzantine Orthodox territory and Armenian kingdoms. And although, um, you know, Soviets were officially atheists, the Russians and others around there, Georgians and Ukrainians and Bel Belarusians, they're all culturally still very Orthodox Christian in their mi cultural mindset, even though they're officially atheists. So the Iron Curtain had been dropped, draped over the Eastern European sphere and the co communist leaders and all nations began preparing to take control and do what Stalin told them to do. Another reason uh, Nezhe was like, shit, okay, I guess I'll go to Moscow. They're taking over here in Sofia. So he first headed to Bucharest, Romania, another place I've been, and then on a train straight to Moscow. And all, on arrival, hopeful of meeting, you know, I think he might have met Stalin. I think Stalin had a lot of respect for him. But hopeful for the, uh, the Red Army organizing and destroying. Stalin had other plans, like he did for millions of people. He eliminated the threat that th he thought this guy was, uh, like a good tyrant, and he was arrested for his anti-Soviet activity in the 1920s and 30s and especially his uh, um, activity with the Nazis in the 40s. So he was locked up in Lubyanka prison in Moscow. His family fled into exile from Bulgaria. And then he was sent to Yerevan here for a mock trial, sentenced for 25 years, and then locked up in a prison in Yerevan. But he was treated nicely, probably not as nice as other Soviet captured prisoners that were tortured or worse. Um, he had a heroic, heroic and historic life. His Soviet army uh, prison guards respected him, especially the Soviet Armenians. They called him Sp Sp sorry for butchering this word, Sparapet, Sparapet, which means leader, even though he was a prisoner, crazy. Okay. From prison, like a Mexican mafia boss, he organized movements like in 1947, uh, giving the Soviets an idea to retake Eastern Turkey again, <laughs> which Armenia considers Western Armenia, which, you know, it was for a while. Uh, it was also the Roman Empire, the Hittites, the Assyrians, and more. You know, we, we could go into that. But yes, some Armenian places like Ani, Kars, the amazing Mount Ararat, which is over there somewhere, I believe, um, are inside of the borders of Turkey, which is the modern border to this day. It, uh, it's really a desire for Armenians for this land to be returned. But again, the Soviet invasion of Eastern Turkey never happened. Then Turkey joined, of all things, NATO, which they're still part of this day, which is they're a very strange member and part of the alliance. But what can you do? All right, so from 1948 to 1952, he was transferred to Russia's largest prison, Vladim Vladimir Prison, a few hours drive east from Moscow. I met some people actually in the square from that city, Vladimir, Russia, a couple days ago. Um, I'm good friends with him now on Telegram. <clears throat> He's gonna help me do some editing, maybe even of this video. <laughs> what up, man? Okay, they're from that city. I met them in the square. Again, transferred uh, to a prison in Yerevan briefly, but back to Vladimir. And uh, all this time, Cold War, 
nuclear weapons being developed, Jimi Hendrix and the Doors making music in the USA, the Beatles and Rolling Stones making music in the UK, communists all over the world, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, who knows what he t was told about the state of the world while he was in prison. Uh, interestingly, the Soviets gave him some freedom on police escorted trips and tours around Armenia to show him how nice the Soviets were making Armenia um, and developing the country. Huh. He died in prison in 1955, loved by Armenians forever. His, his, here's his face you see all over Armenia, the most intense, one of the most intense stories in history I've ever heard in my life. Gagarin Nezhev.